super duper excited uh, with the presence of Christopher Tuffin, who is the co-founder of Sentient Pictures International in L.A., as well as one of our hometown heroes, Andy Schefter, head of production for Sentient Pictures International. So welcome, guys. Uh, so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. So uh, let's just kick it off with a brief intro. Uh, if you can just tell us a little bit about each of your backgrounds uh, and sort of a bit about your work with Sentient. Um, my background actually started in many ways here in Miami. Um, I was, woo! I, yes. Woo. Um, I, uh, I guess around like 1993, I was uh, just finishing my college football career at the University of Houston and found my way into sports, sports production, number of different television series in that space, Prime Sports, ESPN, uh, Fox of Current Affair, um, number of regional and national shows, and moved out here to Miami um, after one of my shows that I decided to finance myself and produce went belly up, and uh, was offered an opportunity to come in bottom ground on a little independent movie called There's Something About Mary, not so little and not so independent. <laughs> that film, um, uh, on that, during that time I was promoted up to production supervisor, ran second unit, um, and, uh, and from there jumped to do another film here locally called Chapter Zero, where I met Andy. So this is going back 25 some odd years ago. Um, and then produced Open Bank with Dave Chappelle here. And then went to New York, became a, a manager producer where I represented Ed Helms and Rob Corddry and Bill Burr and, you know, and Greg Geraldo and, and on and on and on. And then went from there and started uh, a horror company where I produced with Eli Roth and, uh, and uh, a number of Lionsgate titles. Ran from there to Social Capital for eight years where I was Ridley and Tony Scott's producing partner on their independent side, Julie Delpy, um, filmmakers such as that. And for the last uh, 11 years, have been a partner in Sentient Entertainment Proper, which is a management company that represents filmmakers, people like uh, historically uh, David Cronenberg, Shekhar Kapoor, uh, Pierre Morel, who's still my client and partner, our partner, um, uh, William Friedkin, Adam Goyan, so on and so forth. So that I'll, I'll dive a little bit deeper in the chronology as we go along, but that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I did, how I got here. What position did you play? Weak side linebacker, when weak side linebackers look like me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I remember that anymore. <laughs> All right, Andy, jump in there. I know you're, you're a veteran MMFMer, but give people a little, a little refresher and an update. Oh, I don't think I can even follow that. Um, <laughs> I, moved to nine, I moved here, I think, the same, around the same time in 93. Um, I came down here actually as a still photographer. I had gone to film school, but I needed to get out of the Midwest. So I made my way here. I never planned on staying, mm -hmm. right? I was, this was gonna be my hop, skip and jump to go to LA. Uh, I fell in love with Miami. There was a number of people in the film community here who, who, who helped me, who held me up during that first year uh, while I was working as a still photographer and I raised a couple hundred thousand dollars during that year, and a year to the day I moved here, I started making my first movie. Um, so that, I was lucky enough that I was able to do that because I got to skip over production assistanting and all those things that people do when they get out of college, and went straight into essentially producing, and production managing, line producing for other people. And as I tried to form a career based on my, my movie, I had to eat, and so people approached me to production manage or line produce their projects. That segued into, you know, 15 movies or so as that, a couple hundred commercials and uh, 50, 60 music videos over the years. Um, you know, I'm not doing the, 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 all the names of the gazillion people I've worked with, but Chris and I worked together on a couple projects, and then I ran uh, production for him at, at Social Capital for three years. Um, I got kidnapped by a director and <laughs> ran his production company for about five years. Uh, and when Corona hit, we began talking in that first two or three weeks of uh, lockdown. 
the, I think it started, I remember it started on, for lockdown in LA was my, my birthday, March 13th. And I think it was May, give or take, May 20th, somewhere around there, um, was when we, uh, when I was down here visiting my daughter, it was when we solidified. We solidified. Yeah. yeah. And um, Sentient Pictures was born. Yeah. And you know, just to give a little bit of uh, color or differential in terms of, what we do on the sentient side, which is our management business, which is our historical business. And my, my wife, who's my partner, who's also one of the founders and, 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 and runs the company alongside me, was an agent at ICM for 11 years. She started when she was 25. She put together Hustle and Flow, Eastern Promises, The History of Violence. She represented um, uh, Baz Luhrmann, uh, Jean-Marc Vallée, Danny Boyle, Darren Aronofsky, uh, Guillermo del Toro, um, Robert Rodriguez, the list goes on and on and on. And the premise was that we were going to take my experience doing film financing, blend it with her relationship with filmmakers, and create kind of a hybrid where we service that for our, for our clients. And we did that uh, uh, fairly successfully through films like Cosmopolis, A Dangerous Method, Maps to the Stars, TV shows like Feud on FX with Ryan Murphy, where we were nominated for 18 Emmys, four Golden Globes, and a BAFTA. And we had a, a very good run. But what we noticed was is that it was kind of why I became a producer in the first place. And I'm sure it's the reason most of you became, well, got into production and became creatives and producers is you wanted to have some level of control, some level of command of your destiny. And that's really when, if someone asks me what a producer is, it's really a person who takes helm of their own ship. And they say, I'm no longer to become um, subordinate to other people's agendas, but I'm gonna go out there and reach and try to you know, manifest um, my own level of success or happiness or creativity. So after doing that for 11 years and being with an endless number of filmmakers who were prolific in their own right, but they wanted to dictate the ebb and flow of how things were going to go. And I said to myself, I don't want to be subservient um, completely to whether they want to work this year or they don't want to work this year. I watched, uh, you know, just, uh, I'll say this because it's, you know, it's, it's in the rear view mirror. We put together his, uh, Eastern Promises 2 with Viggo Mortensen and David Cronenberg, put together a, uh, a domestic uh, backstop deal with, I believe it was Focus at the time, with Peter Schlesel, with, um, with uh, E1 for International, with an MG of six million or whatever, double envelope with Robert Lantos, when Telefilm did traditional envelopes put together 22 million, had Vigo's deal closed, had David's deal closed, was ready to start going with Paul Webster to go scouting and put it together in the UK. And then just one day, Vigo and David, or Vigo looked at David's script and said, no, I don't wanna make an action movie, but, and it was gone. And it was kind of like at that juncture, I said, I can't live my life like that. I can't be beholden to creatives who can just at the swipe of a pen say, no, it's gonna happen or it's not gonna happen. Um, and. Uh, and so at that moment, we decided that we wanted to be a little bit more of the driving force, or at least a true partner with the filmmakers that we work with. And the filmmakers that still reside on our, on our roster, I call them my friends, I call them partners, I call them clients, because I do service them on films that we don't work with them on. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a much truer, uh, uh, holistic, um, mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship, which if I was to chart it, I could show the increase in revenues for them and us in terms of doing it because we we become more motivated to want to get behind them when we're truly a partner in the in the process. And I think as you've seen the agencies downsize and they've um, reduced the number of agents in their ranks to become more profitable because endeavor content and CAA and all these companies have either gone public or they've brought in investment banking firms to you know, puff them up so that they can go public. Uh, they've reduced their overhead and, and as turned, these, these agents have become managers. Now, now they understand that they have to help not just um, get their clients work, but actually the only way they're going to really make money and be happy is to be a true partner with their clients. So that's been an evolution in the way that we treat it. So when we started the company, um, our ambition was to uh, emulate what Europa Corp had done up until Europa Corp had done uh, Valerian, right. which was to make sub, call it 12 to 25, 25 to 45 million dollar movies. The ones that are 12 to 25 generally don't need a theatrical to drive them in terms of international pricing. 
and the ones that exceed 25 do. So we just did Freelance with John Cena and Alice Free, which we'll talk about in the Colombian panel tomorrow. We did that at 42. We did that with the backstop from, uh, from Relativity. We did that with a 22.5 MG from AGC. The rest we did with tax incentive. And we were able to make that without having a studio on board at 42. Same thing we're doing right now with Canary Black with, um, with uh, Kate Beckinsale, with Amazon as our partner. So it's just about understanding really, um, and this is kind of any questions you guys have, uh, it'll be a lot to what I speak about today, is understanding the boxes. Understanding those boxes, what are those, what are those price points? What are those spaces that international distributors, domestic streamers, domestic distributors, financiers, what are those buckets they're looking to hit? And how to take your projects and squint at them and look at them objectively and say, what am I missing here? And how do I find that correct angle, that correct trajectory into making a film that's, uh, that's uh, uh, attractive to the international distribution and uh, finance space? I'm going to interrupt real quick and go, do you guys know what an MG and a backstop are? No. Just because as, as, as I'm listening to him talk repeatedly, you know, it, like dropping terms, I'm not sure you guys know. Right. And, and, as, and MG stands for minimum guarantee, and that means in any territory when you sell a film, whether it be the United States, Spain, Portugal, Korea, you make a deal. You make a deal that's um, a you know a, a distribution deal that has percentages in there, royalty splits, so on and so forth. But the number that matters, and this will be a big word we talk about today, and I'm sure again tomorrow, is is what's your collateral? What are you taking to the bank? what's being securitized, so that people have trust that there's going to be the, the value to your picture. And that's called the minimum guarantee, and that is a number that the distributor guarantees you that if the movie doesn't make a single dollar, that they will pay the bank, or they will pay you, or they will pay the financier um, in the event of non-performance, or, 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 or even if there's overperformance, that if you have to go and collect it, you still collected that minimum guarantee. And generally, when you do a deal with a distributor, they give you 10 to 20% down of that minimum guarantee. And then on the pot delivery of the picture, the balance is due within you know, a certain period of their traditional haulbacks. A backstop is a deal that you do with a distributor, wherein the distributor agrees to an MG, but you have a 30, generally a 30 day window from the time that you have the final answer print or you screen the picture to, um, to screen the picture to other distributors. If you get a better offer on that film, you pay a kill fee to the distributor. A kill fee could be anywhere from $250,000 to $2 million. Um, I tell this kind of story anecdotally. I, can't, I won't name the companies, but I'll say on, on, on our last film, we had 10 million as a backstop against the US. Um, two weeks into shooting, we got an offer for 15 million from a streamer. So in that deal, I would still have to pay 2 million of that 15 million to the person who gave the backstop. But the nice thing about the backstop is, is it gives you the flexibility to make your movie and hit your strike your finance plan, but also to back out of it should you make something really magical and something that's going to really you know, uh, pop. Mm. Great explanations. This is like better than Wikipedia. I love it. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's uh, let's dig a little deeper. And you know, you said something very interesting earlier on, Chris, about taking matters into your hands, creating your own destiny. It just kind of reminds me of I'm a big fan of the Offer series. Uh, Robert Evans, uh, who decided that the kid will stay in the picture, and that he couldn't do that as an actor, but as a producer, he could control things. So. Let's dig a little deeper into how specifically your relationships with these amazing filmmakers allows you to have more control in the process and avoid those situations where a piece of talent can just kind of walk away and kill your whole project. Well, I think as um, um, trying to remember, uh, Scott Rudin, the, the, the now blacklist of the very prolific and, and really immensely talented producer once said is, making a film is like pushing jello up a hill. As soon as you get close enough to the top, a piece falls off, you gotta go back and grab it, push it back up. And the offer, um, although it is, a lot of those dynamics are relevant to the time in which it happened in, and obviously the mafia piece is with, I guess it happens in other ways. I've seen iterations of that with oligarchs. So 
It does happen in the modern era in some respects. But that really is what producing is. It's a, it's a marvelous series, um, not perfect by any means, but it's except for Matthew Good, who should win every award for paint. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, just, just brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> but it really is what producing is at its core. Um, I think that there has been a, a true a disservice done to the craft of producing in the age of the streamers because it's, um, I did an article recently for, I think it was the, the Hollywood Reporter, where I, uh, where I said that streaming is tantamount to uh, sharecropping. You, um, you don't own the land, you just till the land, and you eat what you till, and then when they no longer want you on the land, they can kick you off. And a lot of producers have seen that as, great, well, someone will give me $2 million to make a movie, and I won't have to do anything. They'll budget it, they'll schedule it, they'll finance it, they'll put it all together and do everything. But what happens when Netflix downsizes? Hmm, I guess that just happened. Right. What happens to that? Where that's, what hap can, you, can you translate that skill set and take it, that same skill set to the international marketplace? It doesn't translate. So the true producer, hearkening back to what you said about the offer, that is what producing is. It's keeping people glued to something. And I use this line, I said this just to Andy the other day, or maybe to one of my daughters, I said, uh, a movie doesn't happen until somebody says, fuck you, to somebody else. When, think about it. When, when up until this point, it's nice. I love you, I love your client. Oh, let's make this movie, it's fantastic. Do you see the script, the script is great. Did you get my notes? I love your notes, they're fantastic. But that's not really filmmaking. <laughs> filmmaking when someone says, I won't do this for less than 10. Fuck you, we've squeezed this budget as far as we can. Either make the fucking movie or not. Or if they, and, that's, and that's either when the one person says, I'm making the film, and yes, let's do it, or this person says, well, they never were gonna really make it in the first place, unless you overpaid them. And by the way, that's not the person you wanna make a movie with either. I've learned in this period having, produced or executive produced over 18 films and financed or as manager put together another 10 or 15 or however many is work with the people who want to be there. Yeah. Dance with the girl who brought you. I always remember that line from Hoosiers where yeah. Gene Hackman is on the sideline. He only has four players on the court and, and, the, and the referee comes out and goes, are you missing the play? He goes, my players are on the court, right? Like that's what you do. When you've got whoever you have, play with those guys. Right. Make the best movie you can. Convince the buyer, convince the financier that you can make them a star. I do it every day. You, you, have, have, to, you have to will a project into existence. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You have to show them what they can't see. That's what you have to be able to do. And you could try it with a PowerPoint, you could try it, you could try it with cutting a promo reel, but it's 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 beat them with the data. Beat them with your passion. You can do it. Yeah. We do it every day. Mm. No, that's that's great advice. And so let's let's break that down a little bit more uh, and see if we can try to make numbers sexy. How do numbers and budgeting sort of play into your process and sort of your, your chess game of getting these projects to go? It's all numbers. Right. It, it's all numbers. I mean, for us, you know, we have multiple sides. We have a sales side. Obviously, there's a management division separately. But production, sales, and packaging all have to align, right? So when we look at the marketplace, we can figure out what the marketplace values a particular project at. Like, what is the actual dollar sign placed on a film by the marketplace with various uh, variables inside of it, being the actors or directors. Mm -hmm. And then we have to figure out how can we make that work financially, budget-wise, right? And that can be pretty hard sometimes where we will, you know, we'll shop locations based on tax credit, we'll shop locations based on actor availability and where they're willing to travel. Um, Obviously, over the last two years, coronavirus and travel restrictions have played into it. Well, where can you move people? How long does it take to move them there? How long, you know, how long is the quarantine period, right? Because all those play into the, the economics of your picture. But all those things have to align. You know, this is the entertainment industry, the movie business, right? We all love film as an art form, but in the end, we are making the most complex widgets, most creative widgets known to man, and taking them to marketplace 
and selling them like any other product. So finding that balance between the two is, is key. But in the end, it is a numbers game. You have to make the math work for a picture to be able to go to camera. Mm -hmm. All those things have to align. What do your sales look like? What do the financing and bank fees look like? Right? What are actor schedules? I mean, it is a, every movie itself, I think, is a miracle in its own right. That's any movie anyway that is not a direct check from a studio. Right, right. Which and is, even then, <laughs> yeah, even, even yeah. then. But the vast majority of films that you see are basically independent in, right. in their financial structure. Right. I would say the the one term, one of the terms, take away from this today is really master the art of leverage. What do I mean by that? First movie ever made that was a true movie was a horror movie called Two Thousand One Maniacs for Lionsgate. It was Eli Roth and I producing and. I remember the first deal I got on that was with Regents, Regent, or Teen George is now at Stars. It was a $300,000 MG for the world. Couldn't make that movie, it was 300 grand. I took that to another party who said, I'll match that 300,000. And then we took it to another party who said, we'll take out that other party, but we can't, you guys can't make this for 600 grand. We need to make this for one and a half. So both parties put it 750. But I had that first chip at the table. The first chip I needed was the first person to raise their hand and said, I'll put some money in. Then you find somebody who'll match it. Or you, you know, there's, there's ways that you can have to leverage your way up into doing this. Even, as a, even us, where we have, I think, 12 territory out, first look, output deals, Germany, Middle East, Greece, Turkey, India, Switzerland. 13. 13, Russia, uh, Latin America, Mexico, Brazil, um, and Eastern Europe. Um, there's still partners that we have in our territories that are like, yeah, that film doesn't work for us. We can't we're up in the Middle East. Middle East, they don't like dogs, right? So we we can't buy your dog movie because they or China, they don't like ghosts. They don't believe in ghosts. They don't. I'm like you know, I was, I was you know, it's 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 things that you would it would never you would never think of that were limitations, political limitations. Um, uh, uh, sexual politics limitations. So again, even if you have the best built mousetrap, you're going to consistently have to get your partners to fear that someone else is going to take that movie or seize that opportunity or they're going to miss the opportunity or they're going to miss being in a relationship with you. Right. And especially in a time when the streamers are starting to get a little bit more buoyant again, and the domestic theatrical business has picked up. Um, it's so funny because there's always some, some, uh, something going on in the world that uh, makes it from, it prevents it from being a perfect storm. And right now it's the euro. The euro is on, on parity with the dollar. Last week it drifted a little bit below, and then you have European buyers who are like. We've got to restructure our deals. We were, and I was like, wait, we weren't restructuring our deals when it was one sixty-two yeah. to the dollar. Were you giving me first first you know, time money? In, yeah, first time in twenty years, the dollar has been where it is yeah. now. So, 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 in, in, to to answer your question and wrap this up in terms of the numbers, the numbers are fluid. They're always going to be changing up until you're close, right? The bank's going to retrade you. Your investors are going to fall out. Your international distributors are going to squabble over the euro versus the dollar, or something about you know dogs or ghosts or whatever and whatever it is, and you just have to constantly create fear of loss of either the project or the relationship with you, and you have to do so in a way that's I always use this term. You have to be in life. You can be genuine and opportunistic at the same time. They're not uh, mutually exclusive. And you can say to somebody, look, I, I need you to help me build my business. And you need me because you need producers who can deliver content. Um, but I'm not going to burn you because I really like you and I, and I want to help you be successful. But at the same point in time, you really need to buy my movie. And don't back out. <laughs> and we do that every day. And we, I think we also use those relationships to even leverage up some of the numbers, right? I mean, there's times where we're just like so close to hitting a number to green light a picture. You might go to a, a distributor who, I only want to pay 250 for this movie in the territory, and, you're, and you know to strike your finance plan, you need 450. And you say to them, I'll tell you what, 
buy this at 450. I need you to buy it at 450. If I burn you on this, on the next movie, I'll give you a 200,000 discount. Or I'll make you an executive producer, I'll give you 5%, I'll give you a deferment of 200,000, or I'll let you keep all the overages in the territory, which we've done a number of times where we just said, what can get you to go to come up 100,000, 200,000? They're like, it's called a buyout. They're like, we want a buyout on the deal, which means that the movie overperforms, they keep everything in the territory. You don't want to do that in the US, but you'll do it in Scandinavia. You'll do it in South Africa. And that might just be enough trade-off for them to say, okay, you got a deal. And you get there. Wow. No, that's the very interesting points. And it's interesting because, you know, right after lunch, we're going to jump into uh, two of our big international partners, which is uh, our two commissioners here from Spain and the UK talking about, you know, the benefits of shooting there. And you talked about getting close to that number. How essential are these tax credits that are offered by places like Spain and UK, uh, or even a little bit of Colombia, in order to make those numbers work? The numbers wouldn't work without them presently, right? Um, tax credits have taken over the industry over the last 25 years since they began being offered in Canada in the late 90s um, as, a, as a hedge against some of the European subsidies that were geared towards art where the Canadian ones were geared towards economic development. Now 31 states, about 27 countries around the world have them, and most companies do not make movies without them or other long-form content. It is fairly unusual, I guess that maybe five to 10% max of the things you see on television, episodic dramas and whatnot, and movies all take part in tax credits. You can't look at your investors and say, oh, this $10 million movie costs $10 million. We could get $3 million back over here, but we want to shoot it here, so it's going to cost you an extra three. But it's just not that three it costs you up front, right? You guys have all heard that movies need to gross at the box office three times their production budget to break even, right? So if your movie costs $10 million, you got to make $30 million at the box office. But if you get $3 million back and you're out of pocket $7 million, it only needs to make $21 million. So you're Mm -hmm. Overall, what you've got to pull in is less to break even and pay back your investors, which is one of the, really the key thing in filmmaking is, is pay back your investors so that you can do it again. Okay. That's kind of what I was starting to say earlier was that, you know, when you get in the business, you're, you're so focused on that one art piece film that you're trying to make. But if you don't look at it holistically as, again, an industry, as a business, if you're just looking at the art of that one film, it's likely to be the only movie you ever make unless you can get it to market and sell it, right. and then do it again, and do it again, especially for the young filmmakers out here. Decades, right? Longer than you've been alive, you want to stay in the industry and be making films and film it projects that entire time. The key to that is to not lose money every time. That's the quickest way to fall out as a filmmaker, right. is to, to lose money. And, and, and building off that point, you will find, every once in a while you hear a story of a rich person who wrote the check for the whole thing. And they exist and they happen. And, but as Andy said, often one and done. At some point, no matter what individual, what company, what fund you're interfacing with, they are going to hand it to an accountant, a CFO, somebody who is in the financial or legal space who is going to squint at it in a very unobjective, dispassionate way, much like, um, Colin Hanks in the offer, right? Right, <laughs> and and they're going to say like, "Oh, I understand what so and so said, but how do we make our money back?" Right, and so you are going to have to become acutely familiar with collateralization, just like you would if you were building a apartment right. building. You're going to need to understand that they're going to want to see a way to get somewhere around. Minimum one to one, one to one point five coverage on their exposure. Um, that they're going to want to see some way to feasibly experience a, a twenty percent ROI on their investment. Um, if you're if you're devoid of those things, you're going to have a very hard time getting through their uh, gatekeepers. You know, I always say there's a, a deal closes three times. A deal closes when someone says let's make a deal. A deal closes when there's a contract sent, and the deal closes when the check arrives. You'll get two-thirds of the way there, 
But if you can't speak to collateral and you can't speak to return or coverage, these key terms, get, get out in front of them and know them. If you're playing a game, if you're playing this like a chess game, have that answer already tucked away, stick it in the back, know where this is gonna end up at the end of the day. And then let them talk about, I'm gonna pay for the whole thing and I'm gonna do this, but know in the back of your mind they're gonna flip on you. And yeah. know where you're gonna end up over here. And then you'll surprise them with how prepared you are. When yeah, and other than the, 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 either the consortium of dentists and lawyers who all invest or the really wealthy person that you know, puts in a, a large chunk of money, the other people who are going to put money into your film are not investing in your film. They're loaning money to the film, mm -hmm. right? Banks don't invest in film ever. They loan money, and they loan money against collateral. Yeah. Right. And, and the greatest fallacy you'll ever see when you read the trades and you hear, two, there's two great fallacies I find that are, are, are increasingly common. One is when it says, so-and-so just acquired $200 million in financing. No, they acquired $200 million in debt financing, in all likelihood. And debt financing is no different than taking a lot of collateral to a bank. And the bank, and any bank, you give a bank $200 million in collateral, they'll loan you $150 million against your collateral, that's what banks do. That's what they do when you buy a house. Right. But they misrepresent that. I would always question whenever I run across those companies, I'm like, but how much of that is actual risk equity? How much of that is actually able to be carved off for overhead, for acquisitions, for development? The other one is valuations, right? Kylie Jenner's worth a billion dollars. She's worth a trillion dollars. <laughs> Kylie Jenner owns you all. I would be fascinated to see if she would go to the street and actually try to lay off that billion dollars, how much she and Rihanna and, uh, and Hello Sunshine and the guys at Range, how much they could really get. Odds are they're going to get 10, 20, 25 cents on the dollar. Um, that's, but that's how valuations work. It's puffery, just like in real estate. Um, so there's all kinds of games that are being played out there. The banks don't play those games. The banks have credit committees. They are smart. They scrub. They look for exceedingly high coverage. They discount. You know what discounting is? Discounting is if I sell a movie to Germany and I sell it for a million dollars. If it's studio paper, the bank will loan me one to one. They'll loan me 100% of the paper. If it's square one or splendid, they'll loan me 80, 90 cents of the dollar. If it's some local video level distributor will loan you 78%, maybe 50%, in which case it's just a glorified gap. These are the terms you want to become familiar with. This is the way that movies that aren't paid for by a consortium of dentists are, are, are made. And it's not hyperly complex. It's like beat them at the math, study it, understand the formulas, and then when they're not suspecting that you understand how it works, surprise them. Because that's when you win them over. It's when they think, oh, this guy came prepared. They came, they came ready to play. And that's when the fuck yous begin. And it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it all sounds more complicated than it really is because of partially some of the, the terms that you might not know. But in the end, it's all simple addition and subtraction and multiplication math. It's not, there are no algebraic equations. Well, maybe a couple, but it's not as complex as it sounds, it's kind of just getting your head wrapped around what all these things are and why they are, right? But the why is because the people who are putting money out want to get it back. It's as simple as that. It's and, and I would say this too, one of the things with, oh, I think why our company out of the gate has, has done exceeded expectations is we already have the filmmakers, we have the writers. You know, we have writers, we have filmmakers, we can package our own films, that's a blessing. Um, we have deep relationships beyond that. Um, so where did we focus our resources? Who did we hire? We hired Andrew Marcus, who was the former CEO at Relativity, to come in. Why? Because he's one of the best financial engineers in the game. We brought in Rebecca Rothi, formerly of Araman, to advise us, putting together our, our, our funding, because she came from the financial space. Our top executives and advisors were the top executives and advisors for the studios and the finance companies. That's where we spent our resources. So if you want to make a new best friend, make a new best friend with an accountant. Make a new friend, best friend with an investment banker or a wealth management specialist or somebody who when you're in that room and you're talking about the passion, they can pull out the spreadsheet. 
and they can be your partner and help guide you through that process. Because it's, you know, they will, again, they're going to try to trip you up. So you always want to have a good financial person in your, in your corner. Whip out that spreadsheet. <laughs> Lay it on the table. It's almost, it's almost like the, the pitch and the creative or the easy part, right? Of, of like, because people get excited. Oh, this actor, this director, and this story. I love it. Let's do this. Like, that's the easy part. Getting them enrolled in the excitement of the creative. The hard part's the math, the numbers, the money. Yeah. It's yeah. Like the romance versus the marriage. <laughs> yes. Indeed. All right, I think we have time for just a couple of questions here, and then we'll break for lunch. Any questions for our good friends from Sentient Pictures International? All right, I'll go to Joe, and then we'll go behind you right after that. Uh, I love your presentation. You guys are like our other part of the organization, which is the Chamber of Commerce behind MFM. Uh, in particular, what do you mean by collateralization of films and, uh, inter and, and intellectual property? What, how do you collateralize that versus collateralizing something like real estate or uh, other physical assets? I mean, there's real direct parallels to, to the same way. I always say if you look at selling real estate versus selling a film, there is a picture of what the apartment building will look like when it's done. And there's a picture, a, a promo poster of what the movie will look like. Then you have a bulldozer on the lot, or you have a movie camera <laughs> sitting right next to the booth where you're, gonna, where you're selling your movie, right? You're, you're announcing to the world, this is what we're attempting to make. You have a, in the case of real estate, you have a historical tax credit, or you have a, um, an economic opportunity zone, some kind of you know, uh, low-income housing credit, and you're gonna bank that with a tax lender. In fact, in our business, the same people who loan historical tax credits in real estates are usually the same people who actually loan on the state and you know and federal tax credits as well. So then when you talk about when you're selling a building and just using really simple math, in order to show the bank that there's liquidity, that there's there's, there's demand for those units, you're going to pre-sell a set number of those units. You pre-sell them at a cheaper price just like you do in the film business. So you say we have 100 units in our building. We're gonna sell 50 of those units for $100,000 each to raise $5 million for a collateral that you're going to then put into, you know, and you're, gonna, you're going to reduce your loan amount by having that on hand and the bank's gonna bank that and then you have, you're gonna gap or mezzanine the balance against the other, the, the, the half, the, half of that value on the remaining 50 units. So let's say if the building was $10 million, you take a two and a half percent, or take a whatever, a two, 20, two million dollars on the tax piece, you take five million dollars on the pre-sale, you take 2.5 million dollars on the gap, and then you pull some, again, you might pull a mez, you might pull a bridge, or you might have to sell through on additional units. Same premise that applies to, to film. You can just replace Units with territories around now, the world. Now explain bridge, gap, and mess. <laughs> I don't know if that's, that's, that. that's the next step. <laughs> that'll that's be part two. Yeah, but why but explains it that way. I totally understand. Because it, it's like construction financing versus acquisition. It, it, it's even more one to one. Is yeah. most of these buildings when they they don't they don't take like it's a million dollars a unit. They take twenty percent and thirty percent deposits. This is the same way that we get a deposit from a foreign distributor. And then you borrow against the rest. So here's this building. There's a hundred units. They're a million each, right? We got, you know, twenty million in actual deposits, but we have eighty million under contract. You can, that's that, that. That's what you take to the bank. So that's it's collateralized under contract. You have this cash, and you have the building. So it's it's super similar, but collateralization is literally just taking those contracts that you have, those pre-sales and being lent against the outstanding amount, which, as he said, can be discounted depending on who that distributor is, right? They'll, they'll give you the 100%. The, of credit, it's, the credit worthiness, yeah. Yeah, the credit worthiness of the distributor. We call them obliger lists in the, in the, in the lending space, the obliger list with their credit worthiness. And, so, and just to your answer, bridge is a short-term loan, generally somewhere between 45, 60, no more than 90 days with really... Uh, a usurous interest. It is the worst loan to get. It is the most expensive money you will ever partake in. A gap is generally 50% of the value of your unsold. And a mezzanine is a hybrid of your ungappable 
territories that you pay, again, a user is some, you generally 130% ROI, and generally, in, in most mezzanine cases, they're gonna buy out that territory completely. So a lot of, there's a lot of mezzanine done in Asia, Japan, China, where there'll be players who'll come in and say, look, it's, it's worth nothing in China today, but after the next uh, party election, they're gonna open up for more Western films, and I believe that I'll put up $200,000 today in my hopes that I can flop, flip this for a million once the market opens back up in 24 or 36 months from now. Absolutely. Well, you guys did it. You made numbers sexy, and we appreciate that. Um, and I think we learned a lot. I love the analogy with real estate. I think that's something a lot of Miami people can understand for sure. Uh, and just a great job. So give it up for Chris and Andy from Sentient Pictures. <laughs>